You're listening to the Partially Examined Life, a philosophy podcast by some guys who were at one point set on doing philosophy for a living, but then thought better of it. This is episode 36, which is a continuation of episode 35 on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, so you should listen to that episode first. Really, listen to that episode first. We're, we're going to skip the uh, usual introductions and rules and all that kind of stuff because we are zipping right to uh, chapter 4 or part B, the self-consciousness chapter, the lordship and bondage subsection. Although we do have one change from last time. While we do still have our wonderful guest, Tom McDonald, we are down a Wes Alwyn who is sick at the moment. You already heard enough of him last time. We heard enough about Kant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to see Wes's uh, Kantianism. Looking at some of his posts online, I'm starting to get the picture. We've been hearing it for two years. <laughs> Kant is good groundwork for Hegel. It's very hard to understand Hegel without Kant. So much of it is responding to Kant. Well, since you brought it up, maybe we should start with the skepticism bit, or do you want to talk about the skepticism bit when we actually get to it? Start with lordship and bondage. Yeah. Why don't we talk about what exactly the lordship and bondage passage is supposed to be about? Okay. Since we're in the self-consciousness section of the book. Right. It was established gradually last time that we cannot have a sense of self, whatever that means exactly, without the contribution of another person. And there was a lot of uh, disagreement on what the interim steps in the section right before this were in getting to <laughs> that when we're somehow conscious of life or projecting life onto whatever the object of consciousness is or something like that. You said something about encountering another person or another, and I think that's one of the weird parts about this section is that it's not um, clear that that's, <laughs> that's what's going on, right? <laughs> that this could be an entirely internal dialogue as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I kind of want to just read from just a, a short section of the text. In section 179, he says, Self-consciousness is faced by another self-consciousness. It has come out of itself. It says, this has a twofold significance. First, it has lost itself, for it finds itself as an other being. And secondly, in doing so, it has superseded the other. For it does not see the other as an essential being, but in the other sees its own self. It must supersede this otherness of itself. This is at least a good enough place to get started. Yeah. It's an interesting notion that self-consciousness sees its identical. Self-consciousness comes in contact with itself and says oh, wait a second, this is me, but it's not me, Yeah. right? It's me, but it's other. Mm -hmm. And it has to kind of reconcile this fact that this is what he means, I think, when he says it comes out of itself. Like, there's a way in which self-consciousness could recognize itself kind of in itself and never recognize an otherness or an other. But as part of this dialectical movement, whether this is logical or historical or developmental or whatever... There's a point at which self-consciousness has to acknowledge that it identifies something that's identical to it outside of itself, and it has to figure out what to do about that. Is that a fair way of characterizing the problem? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. There's an ambiguity here to say that you see something that's identical. I mean, is it really identical, token-token identical, or is it type identical? Thinking of this phenomenologically, which thinking of the initial development of anything phenomenologically is pretty weird, right? You can't just sit back and do that. You have to, it's very imaginative, but that's, you know, yeah. that's what he's been doing all along. In the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, they classify this as generative historical phenomenology. I think that really what's going on, that this is kind of like intuition in a Kantian sense, where intuition is supposed to be examining the relationships, maybe between concepts, but some of them like spatial concepts. So Kant and Schopenhauer say, and even we said last time, Frege even says that the only way to understand the truth of a geometrical proposition is through some sort of spatial intuition. And that is, there's something phenomenological about that. You're kind of putting yourself in the position where you're considering the concepts or the nonverbal equivalent of concepts, whatever that is. And I think that's what's going on here is that he's claiming a logical conceptual relationship between these different forms as we're going through here. So at the moment between this incomplete self-consciousness and the full-blown self-consciousness that requires an other here. Well, to bring that back to the point. So the question was, Mark, I think you had said, when we talk about the self-consciousness identifying itself in an other, you were asking if it was type or kind, I think, or... Yes, or individual identity. So when you see yourself in something else, I mean, are you saying, oh, that's something that is like me, or are you actually saying, that is me? And I think he's purposefully, like, he's saying that this form of consciousness is maybe not sophisticated enough to make that distinction. I'm kind of making that up. I mean, it sounds like 
token token identity is what he's saying. That actually is me. Consciousness is not just seeing something like it. It has come out of itself and found itself in another being. Well, when you just encounter an object that you eat, it belongs to us, and we make it a part of ourselves. And that's what some of the language he uses, is the animal assimilates the object to itself. So that kind of consuming desire and consumption of objects, they're other, but then they are made into part of me. You know, Seth, you just talked about how this line where he says the otherness has to be negated, I have to make it part of me. That kind of derives from the eating and consuming and assimilating things into my own body. So encountering the other agent, this other kind of self-like agent, that's going to be much more problematic because they're going to resist me. That's what he describes in this section, for sure, that that's the movement. He starts off by saying, you have this thing where self-consciousness recognizes or sees itself in another. And I think I agree with you, Mark, that at least for our purposes, it's like finding yourself as token, not type. And then in section 186, he says, I'm paraphrasing here, the encounter of the two self-consciousnesses involve one seeking the death of the other. And I think that's the metaphor for negation in the same way that we've talked about in the last episode, all of the steps that you go through in negating the object. So Tom just mentioned that we have this dialectical movement where consciousness has an object and then negates it. And what Hegel's describing here is this special kind of activity of negation that has to take place when that object is another self-consciousness. No, I like that connection. I got to admit that I had not considered previously for some reason. When it gets to this life or death struggle part of this, I always took it more or less literally because that makes sense if you're talking about, oh, this is his version of the social contract, people in the state of nature coming together. And at that point, they don't have anything else to give but their own lives. There's no property. There's no sense of self that's going to be given up. You know, So that's what you put on the line in this sort of thing. But if you're thinking of it more as these two consciousnesses, they could even be in one head, like think multiple personality <laughs> disorder. And that in these two things coming together, each one seeks to extinguish the other, to establish itself, to take the other into itself. So that just really feeds into this picture of the whole universe as very flexible in where the points of view can be coming from and how far they can stretch, how far these selves can consider. that. Are they necessarily linked one per body mm. or at least do they try? Is it just inherent in the nature of conscious experience to try to expand beyond yourself or contract within yourself? And of course, the way I'm putting it presumes again that there's already a self that's equivalent with the body that's set up, but you know, maybe well, that's, that's not the, even justified. That's the thing is, Hegel wants to try to explain why there does not have to be a self a priori. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's what's sort of very radical and interesting about what he's trying to do. He's completely trying to say that Descartes and Kant and all of modern philosophy has this thoroughly inadequate concept of selfhood. They just take selfhood as given. Maybe not Kant as much as Descartes, but essentially they don't really see the selfhood as generated. They don't consider the possibility that selfhood might be something that does not exist prior to this kind of historical becoming. Right, but once the self comes into existence through this procedure that's being described here, it seems like it can't go away. I mean, yeah, the person could die. Yes. But even if you lose the struggle and you become a slave and you say, oh, your will is my will, master, I will do whatever you say, and you kind of try not to have a self, that doesn't work. Human creatures are made up in such a way that we are not actually able to extinguish the Cartesian point of consciousness in that way. Maybe with enough drugs. <laughs> Let me just say this. There's kind of the key point is that self-consciousness wants to be certain of itself. And insofar as it's been encountering objects and negating them and taking them into itself, it establishes a certain kind of certainty of itself because it, of course, keeps returning to itself. It's like casting a fishing line, right? I mean, you cast out and you always reel it back in. It always comes back to you. Mm -hmm. And what happens when self-consciousness encounters another self-consciousness or itself, it suddenly finds that it cannot so easily return back to itself. It becomes uncertain with this kind of object compared to the way it is with other types of objects. 
So this seeking the death of the other and trying to negate the other is a way of trying to reestablish the certitude of consciousness as it had previously existed or this other non-reflective or non-evolved state of self-consciousness. And so to me, the metaphor of the Lord and the bondsman, him saying there's two different ways that you can approach the fact that you need to negate this other. One is to try to treat it like an object of sense and say, I own this. It is part of me. My will is its will. And what I want is what it wants, right? That's the position of the Lord. Um, and the bondsman is in a different position. And this one I have a little harder time describing. But ultimately, because the bondsman is truly being for the other, even though it's in this position of certitude, the Lord is not being for the other. It's simply treating the other as an object of itself. Right. Just like something it's eating. Yeah, exactly. Now, the bondsman, or the, you know, people say this, call this the master and slave also. The bondsman sacrifices its will, so to speak, for the sake of the Lord. And that movement of acknowledging the other as a holy other and as being, I think he says he's being for another, but basically this sacrifice of the self for the other is the first step that it makes possible the self-realization and then the mutual recognition. So Hegel's key point, and by the way, this is what I think the Marxists pick up on, right, is he's basically saying, if you read this as a metaphor, he's saying in the master-slave dialectic, the master is wholly dependent on the slave. The slave, even though it appears to be in the subservient position, the slave is the only one who's actually in a position to, in Hegel's term, become self-actualized, being yeah. it itself. But it also, the way the Marxist read it, the slave actually is the one with the power because it controls the means of production. You know, the master can't live without the slave, but the slave can live without the master. Right. That's the metaphor. And I think that's absolutely right. This whole passage certainly is more about the slave. The slave is the one who really develops and eventually brings this uh, stage to its fulfillment when the slave realizes that he's the real support of the whole situation. But in the beginning, there is a positive contribution that the master makes. And that is the master is the one who's willing to risk his biological life for superiority. And in that act, what Hegel locates is that when you have this struggle, and one of the combatants is willing to risk his life, but the other is not willing to risk his life. Mm -hmm. The slave just recognizes the other as superior. Like, I am fearful and humbled and awed by what's happened. And so in that moment, the master acquires a new sense of self. Wow, I'm gaining this power. And also he gains the desire of another desire. And that transformation of desire into a desire that is now social is key. Because I think in 174, he's talking about it has to give itself the certainty of itself. It's the idea that the desire can't be given. Like, so for instance, like, you know, we have to eat food. My desire to eat, it's just given naturally. It's not really mine. You know, if I desire to eat Korean barbecue, that's actually mine. But just having to eat is natural. So I think what Hegel's trying to locate is this point where the freedom to think about oneself and to actually desire the recognition of the other, somehow that becomes possible for the master. Yeah. Obviously, for Hegel, all the elements in, in any of this are going to contribute something to the whole. It's not simply the case. Like, we don't want to overread this as this being some kind of emancipation text or, you know, like, we don't want to take the Marxist move with the text tonight anyway. But Tom, what he says that I think sort of points to what you were just saying is in section 190, he says, the Lord is the consciousness that exists for itself, but no longer merely the notion of such a consciousness. Rather, it is a consciousness existing for itself, which is mediated with itself through another consciousness. So in other words, prior to this movement of desire for this object that is self-consciousness, another self-consciousness, there's a certain way in which consciousness has a notion of itself, but it's not actually existing for itself. It's like it's almost in a kind of eddy in the stream, circling around and around. And it's only when confronted with an other that self-consciousness is given the push or the motivation it needs to try and expand and begin to exist for itself. And that makes a certain kind of weird sense, even though this is very odd. 
if you imagine metaphorically that the consciousness that only has a notion of itself that has never encountered another self-consciousness is kind of like true solipsism. And what Hegel's saying is, what a horror, you know, it's a state of existence where you have something that has some kind of identity and some kind of notion of self, but it's a very cheap and poor notion of self. Until you encounter something yeah. that challenges that notion of self, you're really only sort of acting out the part of true self-consciousness. I buy that description, except for the comparison to solipsism. I think solipsism is closer to the skepticism that we're going to get to right in the section after this, that you actually have to have a sense of self in order to say, I am the only yeah. thing that exists. That there's some brute sense, some unexpressed sense in which what you're saying is right. It's not a sense of self, but there's some way of acting where you don't acknowledge anybody else. I guess you could just say that. <laughs> you know, so it's, in other words, it's a purely negative notion of self. Which you use the word notion a bunch of times there, and we should say for listeners who haven't looked at this text that the word notion is used throughout here with a capital N, depending on your translation, as just meaning just the sort terrible. of the empty, unformed idea of something. And that's all the way the dialectic always works is first you sort of get a notion of something, and then you have to fill out the content in some way, usually by reflecting on some contrast. So the notion itself, this poverty, this initial self that is just the bare tautologist I equals I that we were talking about in the last podcast, that would be the notion of self. It's a pure negative. Yeah, I agree with that. And I like yeah. the image that he uses of the other person is the middle term in the relation of ourselves to ourselves. So that self-consciousness is relational but for it to be any kind of real relationship at all, it has to go through something else. Does this echo anything with what we talked about when we talked about Kierkegaard? Kierkegaard says the self is the relation that relates to itself. Yeah, right. Which right. is very Hegelian. He definitely well, yeah. had read this, but I think he's talking about the developed self already, that there's still going to be a fluidity to it because of just this nature of the way it's put together. I'm wondering yeah. about the middle term if what Kierkegaard did was substitute God for the other Absolutely. as the middle term. Yes. He tried. Well, that's actually in here in the part after this, again, the stoicism slash skepticism part. So let's bring that up again when we get there. Okay. Seth, your point about the, how the Marxists pick up on the servant here, where the servant is the real basis of the situation. The point I was making about the master, the contribution that the master makes, what's interesting about this is how dialectically intertwined both of these things are. Mm -hmm. Because even the Marxists will recognize when the master acquires this unnatural desire for the desire to be recognized, that's where you get human desire. And when Marxist economists look at society, they say, look, our desires are human creations, and this is different than natural desires. That's their criticism of liberal economy, that the liberal economy, we just assume that people just have their desires and preferences and whatever they are, that's what they are. So that doesn't matter when we look at the economy. The Marxists, on the other hand, are like, wait a minute, how desires are formed really matters because society makes them. So they would recognize this moment as key. It's not giving the master credit. It's not active. It was almost a passive thing, but it did come about because the master had this strange desire that transcended a merely natural desire. Yeah, that's a great point, Tom. And to follow up on it on the notion of desire. So for the listeners in the text, Hegel, and we talked about this last time, you know, Hegel uses the word desire with a capital, the translator uses a capital D. Which is always gratuitous because German all now it is It is gratuitous <laughs> in German, yes. But the point being that desire is kind of the movement or the motivating force that ties together consciousness and the object. So consciousness has a desire, broadly speaking, to reach out and negate or own objects. And if this desire doesn't exist, then consciousness never really is motivated to move outside of itself. Yeah. And so metaphorically, one way to read this is to say the Lord position is not metaphorically the power position in some kind of a feudal relationship. What it is just saying is that the self-consciousness that reaches out to the other self-consciousness and tries to own it, that makes that first move, if you will, or is motivated by the movement, is in the position of the Lord. And he wants to talk about desire as being the key contribution or the key movement of the Lord in this Lord and bondsman relationship. And he contrasts that 
with what the bondsman contributes, which he says is work, which is, again, is something that the Marxists, I'm sure, picked up on. But the reason that's important is that the Lord desires the other and tries to negate it and own it. But that desire is never going to be fulfilled, unlike with objects of sense perception, unlike with ideas, unlike with all other kinds of objects. The desire for the other, you will never be able to negate the other in the same way, and that desire will never be fulfilled. And what happens is the bondsman, who basically says, I will make the Lord's will my will, and begins to do work, actually creates something concrete. And that work becomes a thing which acquires permanence, and the bondsman can then eventually come to see in his work his own independence. And so what you have here is this dynamic of unfulfilled desire on the one hand, and then the realization of activity, or it's the turning from notion to existence on the other hand. And those two things together is what he means when he says they're both part of the dialectic, but it's not until self-consciousness has created something, made concrete something out of this dialectic, that it can acknowledge and sort of respect its own independence, which is the first movement towards that self-realization. When you say independence, you know, when you think about the way that Hegel moves from calling, you know, an idea appears and it's merely abstract or it's merely a notion. And then through the mediating movement of the chapter, it becomes actualized. Consciousness has to learn what it really means. What does independence really mean? So the master is like the idea of independence. Yep. The notion. Yep. When the master's recognized, it's like, oh, wow, I'm like this independent thing. So the notion appears. But is that actually what independence is? Is independence sitting on your butt while somebody brings you food? (laughs) I think this is still so relevant to a lot of like management labor relations. It's inevitable that when people are in managerial positions, you kind of become lazy and dependent on your workers. I don't, though, buy his point. So he says, the act of creation itself that the slave is doing. So the slave is out there making things and just making things, creating things itself builds up your sense of self. You know, it's not just the other person treating you in a certain way. It's also having this objective effect in the world that you can then look at and say, I did that. And he says that the master is alienated from that. The master's not going to feel that. The slave is going to feel that. I can see that in some circumstances, the way you're saying it. Oh, the master is sitting at home all day and the slave goes out and gets the food and the slave has the experience of hunting and all this stuff. Yeah, okay, that. But that's not how I picture an actual master-slave relationship in the caveman days working out. It would be, here's (laughs) the tribe leader running around with his minions. And the tribe leader will feel just as much responsible. In fact, will feel like, you know, wow, I'm directing these five other guys who are hunting this woolly mammoth. And go there, go there, go there. They take the mammoth down. I, as the master, am going to feel like I did that because I don't give a shit about my minions. I don't even consider them people. I consider them tools. If I really consider them extensions of my body, then I consider their work to be my fulfillment. Whereas I would think that the slaves, maybe they'll feel part of the team and, you know, we did this, but maybe they'll just be, oh, nothing for me, master. It's all, you know, then maybe they won't get a sense of self out of it. <laughs> No, I I, honestly, I think that's a legitimate criticism. Like I said, I'm trying to read it metaphorically as a dynamic. But if you take it the way you take it, Mark, I think you're right. That's why I have a hard time reading it that literally, is that it would fall apart if you looked at actual historical... But wait, the thing is, what Mark is saying is absolutely right. And I don't think that Hegel's argument is that simplistic. I think that it still stands, even in light of that kind of picture that Mark is putting And I don't even think the Hegel doesn't disrespect the masterly position. Like I was saying, the master is a person who really has this sense of dignity and pride and selfhood, and that's an important thing. But the masters of history, they do have to become conservative in the sense that they need to maintain the status quo. Part of the job, once you've reached the top of the heap, no matter what you're doing, even if you're active, even if you're commanding people, you want to keep the order that is. So you're not developing in the same way that somebody on the bottom probably is. And obviously not all the people on the bottom are going to be exceptional, but some of them are going to really, there's going to be something new. And then you also have to think about the fact that the way that technology has transformed human history, you know, technology really comes out of the labor and craft. It's the thing that really changes the human condition from natural into something that is hard to describe as natural. So the slave in the labor is really the mediator that takes humanity from nature to civilization. 
Yeah, these to me are, it's a metaphor for describing this movement or this thing that happens inside of consciousness. And just to sort of tie something a little bit together. So Tom's point is, if all you do is desire and command, but you don't actually produce and are active, then ultimately you're not going to develop. You're going to be missing out on something that makes you essentially fulfilled and complete as a human being. And Hegel is not saying that the bondsman is fulfilled and complete as a human being. All he's saying is the bondsman is put into this position of having to work and create things and be active. And it's this activity of creation or work that ultimately is necessary in order for you to truly get a sense of self. And he's saying, if all you do is desire and have this unfulfilled desire, but you don't actually go out and get active and produce something in this relationship with the other or via this relationship with the other, you're not going to have what it takes to be fully realized. And let me read a couple sentences here, right? This is section 194. To begin with, servitude has the Lord for its essential reality. Hence, the truth for it is the independent consciousness that it is for itself. However, servitude is not yet aware that this truth is implicit in it. Okay? For this consciousness has been fearful, not of this or that particular thing or just at odd moments, but its whole being has been seized with dread, for it has experienced the fear of death, the absolute Lord. In this experience, it has been quite unmanned and trembled in every fiber of its being, etc., etc., right? And then in the next section, the feeling of absolute power, both in general and in the particular form of service, is only implicitly this dissolution. And although the fear of the Lord is indeed the beginning of wisdom, consciousness is not therein aware that it is in a being for itself. Through work, however, the bondsman becomes conscious of what he truly is. In the moment which corresponds to desire in the Lord's consciousness... That's just talking about desire, right? And he says, Desire has reserved for itself pure negation of the object, but satisfaction is only fleeting because it lacks objectivity and permanence. Work, on the other hand, is desire held in check. In other words, work forms and shapes the thing. The negative relation to the object becomes its form and something permanent. And because it is precisely for the worker that the object has independence. So... Referring back to the previous conversation about the other forms of dialectic with the objects of consciousness, consciousness is reaching out, it's grasping, it's desiring objects, and then it's negating them by making them part of itself. It's owning them, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to make this jump from whatever this impoverished state of being is to this next state, or at least even have the possibility, you have got to create an object or grasp an object or go after an object which has independence from you. And you have to recognize that it's independent of you. And you have to reckon with that fact. Which just means you can't negate it. It doesn't necessarily have to have independence of its own. Just even go attack a windmill with a lance. It will resist (laughs) that. (laughs) No, you're absolutely right. It just has to resist negation. And what I think he's saying is that the objects from the Lord's perspective don't resist negation, but he never succeeds in making them part of itself. Whereas the bondsman is able to encounter something that is truly independent and resist negation and then suddenly say to himself or herself, oh my gosh, what's going on? This is something I cannot take into myself that I cannot own. So the master gains this sense that what's really important is that I'm recognized. But the master can't even really be fulfilled in that. Because, like you said, if the slave completely makes themselves subservient, then the master isn't really being recognized by an autonomous other. By an equal, right. It says it has to happen Mm -hmm. both ways for it to work. It's a paradox. The master has acquired and desires this recognition of being superior, But to the degree that the slave becomes an instrument of his own will, he can't be recognized by an instrument of his own will. We need another word in here also to differentiate desire, taken as this brute, unowned thing, like an urge, versus something that is owned. Something that is what you were talking about, Tom, as the Marxist saying that all our desires are created by society. If you as a mature individual can say, oh, this is what I want then that is something completely different. And that requires a level of selfhood that is not present, certainly in this early part of the phenomenology. And I guess the Marxists would argue that if our society treats us like sheep and we don't think enough and that we have this consumerism is the default desire, that that's not even really a desire proper either. We need to distinguish between Mm, proto-desire and personal desire or something like that. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. That makes sense. And in all of the times I was referring to it, I was talking about the proto form, not the personal form. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting here how you get a lot of the existential themes in philosophy are kind of born here in terms of a sense of authenticity. You know, authentic selfhood seems yeah. to be connected to authentic desire, a desire that is not mm -hmm. merely given to me, but something I have made. You also have a lot of the theme of death and negativity how important it is that the slave learns limitation. Seth, like you were saying, the quote about the beginning of wisdom, it begins in the slave because the slave has learned self-limitation and negativity in terms of working and transforming nature and the objects, but also negativity in the sense that their own selfhood is limited by the master. The reason why the master doesn't develop further is because there's this lack of negativity. In 194, Hegel talks a lot about what you were mentioning, Seth, about how the slave experiences this radical fear. His whole being is shaken. The quote here is, this consciousness was not driven with anxiety about just this or that matter, nor did it have anxiety about just this or that moment. Rather, it had anxiety about its entire essence. It felt the fear of death, the absolute master. In that feeling, it had inwardly fallen into dissolution, trembled in its depths, and all that was fixed within it had been shaken loose. And where he's saying that all that is fixed is shaken loose, you see how the slave gains wisdom about the world being fluid and remakeable. The master is a conservative. He just wants to maintain things in a fixed way. The slave learns this transformative character of himself and the world, that things can change. Yeah, you mentioned the connections to existentialism. I guess that passage and all this talk of desire... I also see just that attempt that I was complaining about in the Heidegger episode to connect emotions to ontology, that here, this dread that is being described is an ontological state. How do you put it? It's not despair. It's an existential state. Yes, that's ontology from a phenomenological point of view for an existentialist is this. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. And the more I read this, the more I'm thinking that I misspent my youth. And instead of reading Heidegger, I probably should have read Hegel because I think maybe a lot of it's in here. The difference is that this is where that tradition begins. I mean, I would say Kierkegaard takes this, you know, dread and anxiety from his reading of Hegel, and then Heidegger takes it from Kierkegaard. So there you have the philosophical lineage of this right. theme. But Hegel puts a positive spin on this, where this wisdom we acquire by this anxiety is a positive for the slave because it's about learning that negativity is our ability to change things. Well, it's actually a movement, the translated word is dissolution, right? So, you know, Heidegger talks about anxiety before death, and that's a critical part of the analytic of Dasein, that Dasein's recognition of its own end, right? That's the role it plays in Heidegger, is that when Dasein realizes that at some point there will be no more Dasein, that's a significant and earth-shaking moment for it. Mm -hmm. And in the same way here, when consciousness in the role of bondsman recognizes true anxiety and fear. In this case, it's in a power relation, not necessarily about death, but it's the dread in the true sense of the word dread of the Lord. You have a similar kind of existential moment for the bondsman. But I think in Hegel here, it's playing a different role in that. Remember, I used the word certainty earlier, which is part of the text, that what self-consciousness is striving for is certainty. Self-consciousness wants to be certain of its own being, of its own existence. And what happens in this bondsman-lord relationship is the lord becomes self-certain in the way that we think of pejoratively, like being self-important or self-aggrandizing, which is a form of certainty, but it's not grounded on actually being certain. It's just more like an assumption. The goal is to get to certainty, and the lord assumes it. The bondsman actually loses all certainty, like literally goes through the ringer, because the bondsman had a certain sense of self, which is completely destroyed in this moment of fear and servitude, mm -hmm. and has to be rebuilt mm. through work. And so that's why the bondsman has the chance at some point of recognizing its own independence and forming a solid foundation and becoming certain of itself. But it has to basically lose itself before it can gain itself, and the lord never loses itself. Well, you could also say, though, that the Lord never loses his natural sense of self, whereas because the slave is so thoroughly negated in this way, his remade sense of self is a kind of denaturalized spiritual self. Yeah, it's a very Nietzschean reading of it, that, oh, the master race has a sense of self to begin with, and really it's just if you end up being debased, end up self-reflective in this way, that's sort of a disease. 
Whereas Hegel seems to be saying, no, you actually, the master doesn't have a sense of self, is more like an animal, and is not developing all the way. I think Nietzsche is countering Hegel point for point. This is why Nietzsche is anti-philosophical in a sense. He's saying that this reflectiveness, this development of inner selfhood that comes from the slave, Nietzsche is saying this is a poison. It's resentment. I was oversimplifying Nietzsche, even though he has this picture of the master versus the slave morality. He also thinks that this onset of self-reflectiveness that came with the slave morality becoming ascendant made us interesting. So the fact that we developed this sort of sense of self gave us the ability to create art in the way that we can, for instance, in the way that the dumb masters of old could not have dreamed. Right. That maybe makes Nietzsche a very interesting Hegelian. I think Hegel sums it up kind of nicely in section 196, which is in page 119 of the Miller translation. It says, For this reflection, the two moments of fear and service as such are also that of a formative activity are necessary, both being at the same time in a universal mode. Without the discipline of service and obedience, fear remains at the formal stage and does not extend to the known real world of existence. Without the formative activity, fear remains inward and mute, and consciousness does not become explicitly for itself. If consciousness fashions the thing without that initial absolute fear, it is only an empty self-centered attitude, for its form or negativity is not negativity per se, and therefore its formative activity cannot give it a consciousness of itself as an essential being. If it has not experienced absolute fear but only some lesser dread, the negative being has remained for it something external. Its substance has not been infected by it through and through. Since the entire contents of its natural consciousness have not been jeopardized, determinate being is still in principle attached to it. Having, quote, a mind of one's own is self-will, a freedom which is still enmeshed in servitude. So what we get here out of this Lord and Bondsman master-slave dialectic is this need for there to be absolute dread, absolute fear, in order to create the condition of servitude and the loss of self, the complete dissolution of self, so that you can then basically begin the activity that gives some sort of concreteness to your existence. Otherwise, it's almost like you're a formal abstract being without having gone through this reflection. You're not an individual. Yeah. Yeah. You're a being in general, not being for yourself. Yep. I fear that some listeners might have lost track of the overall sequence in the chapter that we just bumbled from issue to issue through. I sure. want to try to give the 30-second version of it. Okay. So whatever this non-self has been doing <laughs> in the early part of the self-consciousness chapter, feeling some tinge of proto-desire, whatever, at the beginning of this one, it encounters another self-consciousness or another proto-self-consciousness, another unfulfilled, abstract self-consciousness, however you want to say it, another person. And in seeing, oh, there's something that's like me, or there's something that is challenging my dominion as the spectator over my entire world, each self-consciousness feels that same, it's a threat, it's an antagonism. So they sort of put themselves on the line, they each try to negate each other to say, oh, no, no, that's just another object in my field of view. Inevitably, one of them succeeds. I mean, at least we haven't talked about any situation. You could interpret this whole thing as, uh, I think the Marxists interpret it as something has gone wrong, and so there's a condition of servitude as opposed to equals coming together and recognizing each other, which is how it should work. But in any case, in the state of nature, or this initial way, nobody's sophisticated enough to even make that a goal. So somebody comes out on top. That's where you get this master-slave relationship, where the master still is treating the slave just like all the other objects. Is he gaining some sort of self-consciousness from that? Maybe. But the slave is definitely, in having its initial proto-sense of self disrupted to this extent, having to rebuild something from scratch, having to do the work for the master, thereby encountering a bunch of resistances, which is how you reflect back upon yourself. The slave is going to be the one that builds up a superior sense of self. And then to the end of that, you had just read, Seth, the last paragraph, but you stopped short of the last sentence. So let me read the tail end of that. This will get us right into the next section, the freedom of self-consciousness section. Just as little as the pure form can become essential being for it, just as little is that form regarded as extended to the particular, a universal formative activity, an absolute notion. Rather, it is a skill which is master over some things, but not over the universal power and the whole of objective being. We were saying the part right before that having a mind of one's own, in quotes, is self-will, but it's a freedom which is still enmeshed in servitude. The point is, though, when you are in a, in a condition of servitude and you're creating things, 
then you gain some sort of sense of control over the immediate things that you are doing. To be literal about it, you know, I made this pot, I killed this pig, whatever. I can see myself as a causal agent because of those things that have happened. I can reflect back upon myself. Yeah. But that's very directed. It still leaves the rest of the universe, as represented here by the master, who is like the person with the power of life or death over the slave. Mm -hmm. In the next section, this sort of gets generalized. Like whether there's an actual master or not, we find ourselves in a situation where it seems like it's me against the world. And so that's what the next part is going to be about. There's section 198 to open the stoicism part. Unless 197 has anything useful. <laughs> it's a page and a half. Go ahead. He says, ever since it made its conscious appearance in the history of spirit, this freedom of self-consciousness has, as is well known, been called Stoicism. Its principle is this, consciousness is the thinking essence, and something only has essentiality for consciousness, or is true and good for it, only insofar as consciousness conducts itself therein as a thinking creature. The translations are very different. <laughs> it is different, yes. yeah. Okay, so I'm reading from uh, right. the Pinker translation. Which is the online but, version that we have linked yeah. to, whereas Seth and I are reading from the Big Peach book. Either of those are fine. I found looking yeah. at the Pinker translate. I, I've spent so much time with this one that I didn't want to depart from it, but I did glance at the Pinker one, and it, it was illuminating in some ways to see how it's different. You know, and I actually have kind of revised my bias against the Miller translation. I was looking at it recently, and I actually think Findlay's analysis in the, in the back is actually really good. If you want the kind of easier reading version, the Findlay analysis at the end of Miller is actually pretty good. The easier reading version it's of, easy, like, of the know, like most listening. difficult book in the, in the history of philosophy. <laughs> it is. It's pretty good. But anyhow, in 198, I think it's notable that this is the first case where Hegel makes an actual reference to concrete history, because Stoicism is an actual historical philosophy. Roman philosophy. And it's really important that Epictetus was a Stoic. Epictetus was a slave. That's what the word Epictetus means. It means slave. Oh, yeah. He didn't have another name. <laughs> it's good. And then in 199, he says, this consciousness is negative with regard to the relationship of mastery and servitude. And there you go. I mean, if you're Epictetus, you know, you're not loving life as a slave. And you've developed this consciousness. So everything you know, we talked about in the previous movement was that the slave begins to develop this sense of self. And it's an inner sense of self because over the time from the beginning of servitude, you're shut up in yourself. You know, you're not allowed to talk. So the slave develops this more inner kind of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. And Stoicism is the principle that the inner is the true and that we are free in our self, in our thinking. There's a, I don't know which section it is, where he says, whether you're in chains or on the throne, in your mind, you're free. Right. We can refer listeners to the recent Montaigne episode where we discuss this in regards to death and other things. But uh, yeah, just the idea that the first thing for Epictetus, if you have a problem, is say, is this something I can control or not? It's my own thoughts, the movement of my own hands, something I have control of, then I can worry about it and try to solve the problem. If it's something that's out of my hands, then forget it. It doesn't even matter. Mm. Right? So it's the God grant me the... <laughs> The strength to change what I can and the wisdom to accept wisdom. what I can't and whatever, whatever it is. That's the modern yeah. dumbed down version of it. But it's the same thing. Right. It's interesting, though, too, that Stoicism was also the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor. The emperor is not so happy himself. He's got a lot of duties and it's a very formal situation. He's not all that thrilled about it. And because he's a wise person, he's not even crazy about the situation that there are slaves. He's just like, you know what, this is just the way the world is. As long as we can find happiness in our thoughts, as long as we can align with reason in our inner world, that's what really matters. Okay. You skipped over 197, but I think there is a little section in there that's worth calling out about the subject because he's distinguishing between, when we talked about last episode, the immediacy of sense perception and the immediacy of notions and force and the understanding. So... These objects for consciousness have this immediacy for it. And he's trying to distinguish. He's talking about thinking. And he says, We are in the presence of self-consciousness in a new shape, a consciousness which is aware of itself as an essential being, a being which thinks or is a free self-consciousness. For to think does not mean to be an abstract I, but an I which has at the same time the significance of intrinsic being. Blah, blah, blah. He says, For in thinking, the object does not present itself in picture thoughts, but in notions. And then a little further down, he says, in thinking, I am free 
because I am not in an other, but remain simply and solely in communion with myself and the object, which is for me the essential being. The object is now thought itself. That's what makes possible the fact that this is now this independent thought, because thought is its own object. So it frees itself from the outer world in that sense. Which makes it very frustrating, the fact that Hegel is so vague about what the overall entities that are involved here are, because if I want to give a real explanation of that, I want to say that we can only have private thoughts after we have the public, because of course, private thoughts occur in language. And if you're having sort of non-linguistic thoughts, you can't reflect on them. You can't make them an object in the same way. Absolutely. I mean, maybe you could make your own desire an object, but like we were saying before, that's not even identifying it as you, whereas to make your own thoughts an object is to identify them as your thoughts, unless you're having some sort of mental breakdown and you have a voice in your head that says, kill, kill, kill. Maybe, <laughs> you know, you can make that an object without identifying it with yourself. But ordinarily, like what no, we think of as thinking not. involves some sort of self-consciousness, which in turn requires the linguistic. Accounting for that is characteristic of being like a reader of the book. And that's Hegel's point of view, too. We see that this consciousness that Stoicism has is actually derived from the previous movement, but consciousness itself doesn't see that. That's the shape of Hegel's own text, is that at all of these points, consciousness doesn't really understand that what it thinks is conditioned. He uses these terms like, in the experience, the truth of the experience vanishes. Right. In other words, in the experience, the truth of the experience vanishes means we don't understand our own experience in the way that we would if we analyzed it, right? There's a strong, I think, parallel to Descartes here. When he says in 197, to think does not mean to think as an abstract I, but as an I which at the same time signifies being in itself. This anticipates Descartes. I would say that Descartes is a higher form of Stoicism. Yeah, except that Descartes eventually realizes that the contents of his consciousness have to be objective. They have to be derived from some outside source as well. His notion of God is so perfect that he could not have possibly thought it up. It has to have come from God. Well, At least maybe that's, speaking, maybe that's just right? an exception. I'm not going to allow, yeah, I'm not going to allow a discussion about Descartes' proof for the existence of God to take place. The <laughs> reason that I brought that up is because when you were saying that, Tom, it actually made me just think of the Frege episode that we just had. Frege says that the contents of our thoughts are in fact public. Not that other people can see them, but just that mm -hmm. if I'm thinking a thought and you're thinking about the same proposition that I'm thinking about, then we are thinking in Frege's term, the same thought. Whereas we intuitively don't like that. We say, no, my thoughts are private, but everything that passes through your mind, the words that pass through your mind are all public things. And this is what Hegel is saying, that we as the self-consciousness being described here don't understand that, but we as observers can see, ah, oh, yes, okay, that's what's being missed. The Stoics did have this idea of the logos. Reason was kind of like God. The universe is rational, and they kind of worship that. It's like, as long as you're in tune with the logos, then you're cool, and you can be free. But you can only access that through your mind. I read it slightly differently, I think. So you have these stages of consciousness. There's the three stages of consciousness, three different objects of consciousness that have an immediacy to them. But they have a character that requires negation. So the consciousness recognizes them as kind of other negates them and then realizes and brings them into themselves. Then it encounters this fourth type, which is a special type that it cannot negate or at least overcome in the same way that it does these other objects. And it comes to this realization about itself. Like it's the movement. The other self-consciousness is what generates activity and true existence for consciousness. We haven't even used the word human being at this point. Hegel at this point says, now that the self-consciousness has reached this level of awareness, which is not yet full self-awareness, but it's more than it had before, then it begins to see itself as something that thinks, because it's for the first time, it is certain of its own independence, that it can take as an object something that is wholly within itself. So think about that for a second. Up until you go through the Lord Bondsman reflection, mm -hmm. all the objects you take are quote-unquote outside of yourself, and what you do is internalize them, so to speak. And then you reach this point where you have a certain kind of certainty about your own independence as a being, and then you suddenly are able to acknowledge these things called thoughts. And you say, wow, here's an object that I don't need to negate because it is not outside myself. Mm. 
and he says basically that key about Stoicism was it was the first movement, the first philosophical movement, or the first unfolding, you know, of the history of spirit or whatever, that acknowledged consciousness is a being that thinks. It's the historical origin of the substance that thinks or a thinking substance as being essentially what consciousness is. That's kind of an interesting move on Hegel's part, but I also think it's an interesting move in identifying it in Stoicism, and it's an interesting move in saying that you have to establish a certain amount of, like you said, Mark, the social or the external in order to come to a recognition of the internal. Mm -hmm. Which is, it hits on an interesting ambiguity here that I felt in saying, oh, other people are necessary for self-consciousness. I mean, does that mean other people are necessary for me to have a concrete sense of what I am? That's a story that makes a lot of sense to me. How do we know who we are? How do we develop a sense of self? Well, because people treat us in certain ways. Your parents treat you in certain ways. They put you in certain roles. You're now a student. And then you're not, and then eventually you're able to turn that around and not just be who other people tell you you are, but be yourself, be an authentic self. So there's a story that makes sense. But Hegel seems to be, even though that certainly comes out of Hegel's account, saying something much more fundamental, that we just don't even have self-consciousness at all. Not substantial self-consciousness where I say, I am a father and a, an American and that kind of role stuff, but self-consciousness at all. You don't have thinking where you identify those thoughts as yours. You don't even have that without somebody else. You know, you said before about how we have this sense of self and it doesn't seem we can lose it. Right. So that's an interesting thing about the text. He's talking here about origins. And there's a lot of debate about whether this movement has to take place for everyone. Do you have to go through these things? Or is it now that we are this more evolved society, we have this solid sense of selfhood and we don't have to experience these things again. And maybe that's why we become less authentic in the modern world, because we've forgotten the actual origins, the genesis of how this idea of selfhood came about. You have to put your life on the line and then you get a sense of self. And that's something that was, according to this picture of lordship and bondage, was sort of part of the initial acquisition of self-consciousness. But it's not something we have to go through being raised by our parents unless your parents are abusive assholes. And <laughs> even then, it's not something comparable because it's not a symmetrical thing coming together. You know, as an infant, you're just defenseless. It's not comparable to what's being described here. But that's also a, another interesting way of talking about this text because you could think of the master-slave relationship as the child-parent relationship. That is an analogy that people do apply to this text fruitfully. I want to come back to that point because I actually have a side note. To, I was going to ask if... There were other metaphors besides Lord and Bondsman that would be appropriate. And Husband, wife. There's a tradition of feminist readings that read the master-slave passage as the domestication of woman. Okay. That's right. The men remain unthinking brutes <laughs> exactly. while the women develop a rich self-consciousness. And if only then all the men would die off, then the women could... Anyway, that's sort of the uh, what happens in this book, Herland, that I read as a perspective uh, thing for our <laughs> feminism topic that we'll have a couple episodes from now. And you'll be able to tie back to Hegel. So that's fantastic. <laughs> Let's at least talk to the stoicism and skepticism. Yeah, right. I'm going to do a quick summary. I'm just going to kind of call out the two points. And then there's a whole thing about unhappy conscious. So bring us up to why what's wrong with stoicism. As I mentioned, he says stoicism is the first place where we identify a consciousness as a being that thinks. Stoicism has a sense of freedom about it, that it's freedom of self-consciousness. And what he says is, but the truth is, it's only a freedom of thought. It's not true freedom, like freedom in reality. It's the freedom that comes with focusing on things that are completely within your control, like inside yourself or part of yourself. And he says, this becomes contentless and tedious I put that in quotes because I thought that was funny. But that the idea that freedom of thought is ultimately going to be unsatisfying. It's the freedom to have thoughts. And the freedom to think is just simply the freedom to sort of spin on your own axis, if you will. Yeah. I like taking that literally, that if you can have thoughts, but as long as you are denying that the outside world sort of matters which is what the Stoic does. It says, if it's not something I can control, then screw it. I will just float like the leaf on the river or whatever, whatever your favorite <laughs> metaphor there is. Right. That means your thoughts aren't actually pointed at anything out in the world. The way Frege, remember, says, you know, your thoughts actually grab a hold the point of things that are objectively out in the world, whatever objective means here, <laughs> according to our experience of it. And if you're denying that, then your thoughts are empty. They're not going to be fulfilling. 
freedom of thought, which is Stoicism, has the same relationship to quote unquote true freedom, what he's going to describe in skepticism as the first stage of consciousness has to the self consciousness that realizes itself in another. It's just a notion of independence. Yep. It doesn't have the actuality that you get at a certain later stage. So this is the whiny adolescence in the development of spirit. <laughs> It says it finally <laughs> develops a sense of its independence, but now is being everything else sucks anyway, man. It's, it's writing bad poetry about problems that it thinks are unique and listening to Morrissey. And uh... <laughs> literally, for this skepticism, it's basically saying that look, all this freedom that stoicism is talking about is a bunch of bullshit. And the skeptic has to be a person who starts to say, wait a minute, I'm not buying that. I don't think that's real freedom. And so the skepticism negates these stoic beliefs. Section 202. Skepticism is the realization of that of which stoicism was only the notion and is the actual experience of what the freedom of thought is. So it's not just the notion of freedom of thought. It's actual freedom of thought. But it ends up being worse. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is in itself the negative and must exhibit itself as such. He goes on in 202 to say that skepticism corresponds to the realization of the concept of self-sufficient consciousness as the negative orientation towards otherness, desire, and labor. You see how you get the pattern. It's the same movement as the slave was in the previous phase. The skeptic realizes that when I doubt this stuff that the Stoics are saying, that's my doubt. It's not just this universal principle of inner freedom. I doubt this stuff. And I'm negating those principles. Like Seth was saying, it's the realization of the principle of Stoicism becoming actualized and becoming authentic. The only difference in my reading here between what you're saying is you're thinking of Stoicism and emphasizing sort of the positive elements of Stoicism where it says it acknowledges reason, like you were saying, and I want to live accordance with reason. And skepticism is questioning that, whereas I feel like the focus in the text here is on the relationship to the outside world. So the Stoic yeah. says oh, I only have to care about my own thoughts and everything else out there doesn't really matter. And skepticism only goes farther in the same direction, which is not to say the outside doesn't matter, but the outside, I can't even know that it's there anyway. It's a complete rejection of the outside. Both of these are despisers of life in Nietzsche's way. Uh, yes. And the yeah, skeptic that's, is that's more, more yeah. profound about it. The skeptic gets active about it. If we go back to that whole idea of desire and work and the sense of activity making something permanent, Stoicism is kind of like skepticism in theory, whereas skepticism is the actual practice, right? I mean, stoicism says, eh, shrugs its shoulders and turns on itself, whereas skepticism is like actively applying the principle of the outside world doesn't matter. Hegel's, he says in a number of places, he thinks that the ancient skeptics are more important and interesting than the modern skeptics, because you know, modern skeptics like Hume they still have this sense of selfhood that they hold to, like a modern sense of selfhood. They just doubt the external world. Whereas the ancient skeptics, like Peronian skeptics, were much more radical. And I'm not really familiar with Peronian skepticism. So I don't know if either of you guys are to no. speak to. Well, I can say a little bit about, in fact, this points at the difference. So we just had the Montaigne episode where we talked about this quite a bit. But the difference between Montaigne and the ancient skeptics that he was writing about is that Montaigne believed in the Christian God. Whereas the Peronian skeptics would say, you know, we have no idea about any of that kind of stuff. Whereas Montaigne says, oh, lucky we have revelation, which tells us there is an absolute out there. But mm. our faculties are so pathetic that we really can't ever get at that absolute. And so we just shouldn't even really try. And so he's, I think, more like the modern skeptics. And this is exactly what Hegel in the introduction of this book criticizes skepticism, what he calls skepticism there for, which is assuming that just like he thinks Descartes and Hume and Kant all do this, maybe not Hume, but at least the other guys, that there is an absolute out there and he calls it the absolute, but you don't have to assume that there is a God or something. You just have to assume there is the way things are in themselves and that we are divided from that by this unbridgeable gap. And Hegel says, instead of arguing against that and sort of using this epistemology to work his way across the gap, he, and we discussed this in the Heidegger episode earlier, because Heidegger takes this just from Hegel, just denies the premise, says like, look, if you're going to say there's an unreachable thing in itself out there, you need to argue for that. Don't just assume that there is a thing in itself out there and then, you know, say, oh, whoa, we, we, we've tried to reach it. We try to get certainty, but we can't get it. <laughs> No, you're the one who's doing something completely unwarranted by creating this problem in the first place. 
So the Peronian skeptic is going to be less objectionable than that, really. I mean, it's denying the outside world, but it's not saying, oh, there really is an outside world. We just can't know it or something like that. What Hegel thinks is good about the skeptics is the negativity, because it's the negation of negation that Hegel sees. He's saying, look, negativity is the recognition that we should never recognize anything fixed as the ultimate thing. I had a really hard time understanding. Like, I think I got what he was saying about why stoicism is flawed and how skepticism is kind of, but I had a hard time with understanding the criticism of skepticism. So can I try to talk through it real quick? And Yeah, this is like uh, 206. Is that where uh, you are? Exactly, 206. So if stoicism is this false freedom of thought or this uh, the notion of freedom of thought, skepticism, which makes this freedom of thought a reality, by actually doing the negating of the external world or doing the negating of otherness in general. Skepticism negates otherness, but to account for the fact that it had to do the negation of this otherness to begin with, it sort of has to fill the void with itself. It sort of says, oh, there's this world of objects that I think of as independent, but then I negate that and say, actually, they're not independent. I'm going to deny that they have any even sort of existence. But to account for the fact that I thought there was this world to begin with, I have to fill them with my own existence. The whole external world is me. The world of appearances. The world of appearances, sure, whatever you... Which is all there is, right. Right. He says, what happens is, this is 206, skepticism, consciousness truly experiences itself as internally contradictory. From this experience emerges as a new form of consciousness, which brings together the two thoughts which skepticism holds apart. So you're moving into the unhappy consciousness. Well, I'm just trying to understand what's wrong with skepticism right. from Hegel's point of view. What would make you jump to the next one? Yeah. Mm. He likes it because it does a negation, right? That's a good thing, that it's an active negation of something. But the problem is, is that it ends up in some kind of a state that's not cool. The state it ends up in is what he describes as unhappy consciousness. But basically, my reading of that is that Unhappy consciousness is just simply that skepticism essentially forces consciousness to split itself. It creates a duality that it has to reconcile. Let me read the second paragraph of 206, which might be as coherent as this translation gets at any point. In Stoicism, self-consciousness is the simple freedom of itself. In skepticism, this freedom becomes reality, negates the other side of determinate existence, but really duplicates itself and now knows itself to be a duality. Consequently, the duplication, which formerly was divided between two individuals, the Lord and bondsman, is now lodged in one. The duplication of self-consciousness within itself, which is essential in the notion of spirit, is thus here before us, but not yet in its unity. The unhappy consciousness is the consciousness of self as dual-natured, merely contradictory being. I think I have two readings for it. Okay. Let me throw them out at you. I'm excited. One of them is that you say, there are all these appearances of things, but there's no way we could know if there's anything behind them or not. But still, it's not like I can personally control the appearances. Like, that's just the way they appear. So if I take the skeptical turn, then I have the thing that the Stoic said was freedom. I've got my own individual judgment that's the observer. But then I also have what I'm saying is a part of me, because this really comes down to solipsism, right? I am the world. I can't know anything beyond my own consciousness, but there's still the subject-object polarity in there. So in that sense, you're divided from yourself, right? You've got the world of appearances is also you. So that's one okay. of them. The other one is that if you're going to be a skeptic, you're inevitably going to be a hypocrite, because every action that we take has to assume that the ground, it really is there in front of me so that I'm about to step right. on. So you think you're being so free or whatever in saying, I'm not going to take a position on any of this. Maybe I'm not even going to say that it's not there. I'm just going to pull a husserl and it's the epoche and say, oh, well, I don't know what's actually behind it. I'm not going to theorize it. But in any case, whatever you're doing, you're creating this theory and putting your sense of self in that. Whereas your body and everything you do is acting according to some other principles. So you're divided in that way. Yeah, I think that's great. I don't know. Which of those? Are they both right? <laughs> oh, they're both right. I don't know. Neither of them really fits exactly. Neither of them makes the two self-consciousnesses that have been created here mirrors of each other in a way that is uh, comparable to the beginning of this chapter where two self-consciousnesses came together because it seems like structurally that's what Hegel's trying to do is reverse that step in a certain way. Now I've gotten a sense of self, but now I reflect it outward in the same way that I got my sense of self from this outward reflection of another person. 
the transition to unhappy consciousness, I think, has to be noted that there's sort of a model of Christianity. He clearly is alluding to medieval Christianity and the unhappy consciousness. It's this idea that God comes in as this mediator between this kind of contradicted sense of selfhood. You know, the skepticism about the world becomes this idea that the world is evil and the only thing that's real is God. And that, that's sort of the thing that he's getting at in Unhappy Consciousness. So I don't know if one of you guys can help bring us up to that. Can we just read 207? Just right after Seth had stopped, uh, number 207. This unhappy, inwardly disrupted consciousness, since its essentially contradictory nature is for it a single consciousness. So in other words, maybe what I was just objecting to that, oh, it's not two self-consciousness looking at each other. It doesn't need to be that because it says right here, it's in a single consciousness. I must forever have present in the one consciousness, the other also. And thus it is driven out of each in turn in the very moment when it imagines it is successfully attained to a peaceful unity with the other. So inward conflict here. The critical point here is that you have this struggle where you have a single consciousness that has two parts that don't realize that they're part of the same unity. Mm -hmm. And he contrasts this. He likens it to the split between the Lord and bondsman, but he says it's all contained in one consciousness as opposed to two consciousnesses. Mm -hmm. which I think is about as much ammo as you're going to get for reading the Lord and Bondsman section as being between two distinct individuals as opposed to like an internal metaphor like I was trying to argue for earlier. So consider my point suitably dashed on the rocks of section 206 and 207. All this stuff about the changeable, everything that comes after this is about the fact that this is the critical next movement for consciousness, that whatever step it needs to take, it splits and it, it has this duality that it has to reconcile with unity. If one of the consciousnesses is to win, if radical doubt triumphs over the external world or some sort of realism about the world triumphs over the skeptical self, you'll ultimately have defeat because that's not really what the right answer is. It needs to be mediated, as you mentioned, Tom, but you have to let the tension be there in order for the mediation to be able to take place at some point. Right. So the Stoicism and Skepticism, the idea is that they're both internalized in a single consciousness that is now aware that it holds this conflicting views. And I sort of read that, like in 209, he says, there's a struggle against an well, it enemy. It says it's not aware. They're both in the same consciousness, but it is not as yet explicitly aware that this is its essential nature or that it is the unity of both. So no, the unhappy consciousness stage is not being aware of your being conflicted. It's a matter of you having these conflicted things within you and you don't have enough sense of self to realize that these are both you. You, in fact, externalize one of them. You say one of them mm. is the big, bad, unchangeable world. That's a very short step from stoicism, which says, my thoughts are what I can control, everything else I don't care about, to skepticism, oh, everything else, in fact, is not even there, or I can't know anything about it, to the unhappy consciousness, which is saying, everything out there is an unchangeable thing that I can't do anything about, and in fact, it is essential, whereas I am changeable and inessential. And so okay. having low self-esteem, whereas this is just internalizing the master. This is feeling the sting of the superego upon you and seeing it as God or as the universe all stacked up against you. But you could say that the skepticism felt that the world is an illusion. So now the unhappy consciousness still thinks that's the case. But now it also accepts that I also have to hold on to something, whereas the skeptic didn't do that. Now the unhappy consciousness sort of has this belief that there's something that's unchangeable. There's something I can depend on. There's something out there that we can all anchor ourselves on. That's this unchangeable belief in this transcendent foundation. So that's part of its life now. That's how it's contradictory. That's how it has both of them in itself. Acknowledging that point, what I heard Mark saying was, if you look for that unchangeable in either of the two sides of this duality in consciousness, right. though, if consciousness does that, that's where the mistake is. And that the unchangeable is the thing that's going to mediate these two parts and ultimately allow them to recognize the unity. And you could say, too, though, that in a sense, the unchangeable is not this far off thing. Because the fact that the unhappy consciousness believes in the unchangeable is itself the actual glue that's holding their life together. It's just that they don't believe it belongs to them. I don't know what it is, and I'm not saying it's near or far. All I'm saying is that the first stage or the first movement, as he would say, is 
for one side to either think of itself as unchangeable and try to vanquish the other or to see the unchangeable in the other and be sacrificed. What needs to happen is the unchangeable, which is neither side of the equation, is the thing that allows the two parts to recognize themselves in a unity. Contrast that, what we were talking about before, with the lord and bondsman relationship, where there's sort of imposition of desire or and then loss of self. Here he's saying it's mutual. I think we have to have an image here of Christianity. Imagine that you have a couple believers, and they feel that their bodies are sinful. They don't care for their own individuality. They believe they are nothing next to God. But there they are, the two of them. They recognize each other as equals, as equally nothing compared to God. Yeah, equal before God, yep. Right. And that idea of God has a function there. It mediates their recognition of each other, but they don't see it as their own idea. They don't see it as part of themselves. So are you saying that Hegel's just using other words to cloak Christianity? Findlay, in the back of the Miller book, says this outright, that there's a lot of to suggest that Hegel is modeling this passage on medieval Christianity. Solomon says that too. The problem here is that they don't acknowledge individuality. They think that individuality is nothing, whereas this universal thing is what's the real substance. So in 2.10, Hegel says, In this movement, consciousness experiences emergence of individuality in the unchangeable and the emergence of the unchangeable in individuality. So we have here... The individual is nothing. The universal is everything. How do we get past this kind of belief? If you go down this Christian reading, Jesus Christ is the flesh and blood concrete individual where the universal becomes an individual just like us who is negated and dies. And his individuality is like a natural individuality that is like nothing because it bleeds and dies. When the unchangeable becomes an individual, when it moves from universal to individual, it gives the unhappy consciousness something that helps it to move towards reconciling this conflict between the universal and the individual. That certainly gives us a lot of food for thought about thinking about what Nietzsche thought of Hegel, for sure. I feel like we skipped a step, and I just want to go back here. So the stage of consciousness where you have this conflict, unhappy consciousness, you have the two sides sort of struggling between I'm the changeable, I'm the unchangeable, what have you. And then they come to acknowledge the unchangeable as something outside of themselves. And this has two effects. One is that it brings the two sides into a unity. The other is that it creates acknowledgement that this consciousness is an individual or particular, unessential, whatever you want to call it. And then the essential, unchangeable, non-particular being, which is not a consciousness, but as a being, is spirit. The relationship between this individual consciousness and spirit, there has to be something that mediates the relationship. This is kind of like launching into the next section of the book that we didn't read, but it's basically reason. Reason is the mediator that bridges the gap between individual consciousness and spirit. Right. Reason is the way that, unlike understanding, which is what science uses, the faculty of understanding that tracks appearances and regularities and appearances and hence scientific laws, reason is what enables us to do this thing that Hegel's been doing throughout the book, which is sort of putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, doing this imaginative phenomenology of uh, different forms and things. And so that's how we in fact, the correct way of doing science, which in other words, the biology of his day, which was taken as the prototype science, and this is all from Schelling's philosophy of science here, is to see everything as a living system that part of the way you know about it. And in fact, the faculty of reason is all about being able to imaginatively identify with these various systems. Just like when you're asking about apparent teleology when talking about evolutionary theory, even if you have some sort of, oh, it's ultimately that breaks down to chemical connections and ordinary causality. The way you do the science is to think teleologically. Right. And just to make the connection more clear of how you get from the unhappy consciousness to reason, the world of Enlightenment humanism or Renaissance humanism is in part mediated by the idea that the Christians come to recognize, or at least the enlightened ones, come to recognize that this was our idea all along. The idea of God becomes reason. Reason is what mediates our community. We were reasoning all along, and it's really us. 
So that's how unhappy consciousness is able to shift from negating its own individuality to affirming the individuality of real flesh and blood human beings, as long as we are rational. So you get this logic that the world of reason is the world that is going to say, hey, you know, even though we're all contingent, inessential individuals, that's okay, as long as we have this uh, rational community. Yeah, that's really well put. And I'm going to read section 228. He says, in the mediator, then, this consciousness frees itself from action and enjoyment so far as they are regarded as its own. As a separate, independent extreme, it rejects the essence of its will and casts upon the mediator or minister, in parentheses, priest, its own freedom of decision and herewith the responsibility for its own action. This mediator, having a direct relationship with the unchangeable being, ministers by giving advice on what is right. The action, since it follows upon the decision of someone else, ceases as regards the doing or the willing of it to be its own. So that is the funkiest, weirdest thing <laughs> to say that reason basically allows consciousness in this to divorce itself from thoughtless willing or doing and then reason acts almost in opposition to what consciousness wants or what the body wants or what have you and can say, no, don't just do, do the right thing. But it takes reason to tell you what's right. And then to obey the dictates of reason is to somehow attain the state that you want to, I don't even know the right words for it, but I made these notes and I was like, okay, so we have desire, work, enjoyment, thankfulness all of these parts of the individual unessential consciousness, reason then mediates a relationship with spirit and reason. And then all of this is accomplished through mutual reciprocal self-sacrifice or self-surrender. And what this tells me is that if reason is what mediates to spirit and reason is essentially the ability to obey the dictates of somebody else. Yeah, rules. That reason is essentially duty. Sure. He's read his Kant. Right. <laughs> and that's how we kind of close the self-consciousness section is that you've gone through all this work of recognizing yourself, of fighting, struggling with otherness and objects and all of this self-realization and stoic position, you know, freedom of thought and then skepticism. You reach all of this just to get enslaved to reason. <laughs> right. But... <laughs> There will be a liberation from formal reason, and that comes even later in the book. Well, hold on. Taking the Kantian analogy seriously, then this being enslaved to reason is a certain kind of autonomy, and we've explained that many times. Absolutely. This is a positive moment at this point oh, in the book. I, I'm sure it is. Seth, it sounds like you're shooting ahead to your Heideggerian sympathies. <laughs> no, it might be. It's just, it's this fetishizing of reason that I don't like. Reason is not the end of the book. Spirit follows reason. So spirit is where Hegel will critique formal reason from the standpoint of further investigation of what reason really is and how it really works. It's historicity, yeah. Yes, exactly. So that what seems like the superego of a society, right, duty, ends up right. being relative to that society. And mm -hmm. so he has to move to a meta level as a philosopher mm -hmm. to take a look at that. And then it does become something very Heideggerian. Okay. I appreciate you trying to salvage this for me, and I'm I'm sure at some point I'll put in the effort to read the next 300 pages to find no, that answer. from everything that I've heard, we have read the good part of the book. The rest of the book <laughs> right. is all sprawling. No, come on. There's great stuff in the rest of the book. Reading his later works where he's thrust out this notion of spirit a lot more cogently is going to give you a better representation of what he's after there than his initial crack with that here. Whereas the fluidity and the motion between the stages and the first part of this book is something that he just never is able to replicate later in its brilliance. I think that this point in the book we're talking about is hugely relevant to contemporary discourse. For the most part, especially in the United States, in the Anglo intellectual world, people who are the upholders of reason really don't think of reason in this historical sense. The way that that emerges out of Christianity is an important argument. I think it's not widely enough considered. Let me recast what you just said using his technical definition of the faculty of reason as opposed to the faculty of understanding is all tied to this being able to apprehend other things that you're studying, whether they be other people or natural systems or whatever as organisms, that that comes out of Christianity or out of religion. It doesn't have to be Christianity specifically, 
from skepticism of denying that we can know anything about anything or stoicism and saying all that stuff out there doesn't matter, we move into a phase where we say what's out there does matter, in fact, is unchanging. And then we personify it, that we use piss poor science. And this would work for any religion, whether you say, oh, all of nature is a dude that's looking at me and judging me, or you take a more Shintoistic, pantheistic, there are spirits and everything. Either of those right. ways ends up getting at what he thinks is then a good approach to science, which is Hegel's notion of reason from Schelling, which is something that is very foreign to us now. Wait, but Mark, wouldn't you agree, both of you guys, would you agree that we could characterize our world intellectually as very much divided between reason in the sense of formalistic reason that just kind of assumes reason is given, doesn't have a historical sense of it. And then this fundamentalist religion idea that there's a transcendent mediation, what we should really be believing in is this. So we have formalism and a very technical idea of what reason is on one hand. And on the other hand, we have fundamentalist craziness. And isn't in that sense why it's so important that maybe we do understand what Hegel is trying to ultimately get to beyond reason in his concept of spirit? Uh, we would say, oh, fundamentalists, we retain as a sublated moment <laughs> in our own, you know, it's usually a criticism. Those atheists, they just have a new kind of faith. Whereas Hegel might see this as a positive thing that, yes, we have this new kind of faith in this man-made creation that we can stand behind as opposed to faith in this unknowable thing that was thought up by savages way back in history. We shouldn't say anything else about reason because we didn't read that section and <laughs> I'm just going to be bullshitting. Even what I do know about shelling and stuff, that's all from the Solomon. I don't have much memory of reading the actual text here. When I got to that point myself, I was just like, this book took it out of me, man. <laughs> And I mean that in, a, in both a good and a negative way, right? It's negative in the sense that it's sad that I've reached the stage of my life and that I'm so distracted and I don't have the stamina to read philosophical texts anymore. This is brutal, though. But this is one of those extremely difficult but extremely rewarding texts yeah. as well. There, are, like Mark had a different feeling about Husserl than I did. You know, I was like, Husserl just, the Cartesian Meditations is just hard to read and it's hard to read unnecessarily. And It sounded like all you guys disliked reading it. It's not fun to read, but Mark got a lot more out of it than I did. The Hegel, this is the first time I've actually spent this much time trying to really plow through this. And I've said this before, how I feel like I'm a better reader of philosophy now than I was even when I was in grad school. But it's really tough going. And it'd be interesting because of the way he's using the language and because he's obviously, like you said, Mark and Solomon points out that every section of the book is basically like an implicit criticism of some other writer mm -hmm. or some historical movement or whatever. You could spend a good couple of years probably just wading through this. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And Tom has. <laughs> and Tom has. That's right. I've wasted half my life. Actually, Derrida says this thing that life negates itself in literature so that it may survive better. It's a little ambiguous there about surviving better, but I think the idea that we negate ourselves just in studying these texts is that life negates itself in studying text is... Uh, Kind of an interesting poetic point that he makes. Mm. But if if you just listen to a podcast about the text, you don't negate yourself at all. You can still be, you could be jogging. You could be. <laughs> all you have is the notion of negation. If you listen to us talking about this, all you have is the notion. You need to. And I'll end on that point and say this one's worth the effort. This one is worth. I think spending a little time on for people who are looking for a challenge. And I would have to say also have some background in philosophy because this is not one I would start off with. Well, and you can also read Findlay, his analysis in the back. It's Hegel light. That is the forward of the actual peach edition of Phenomenology of Spirit. It's not buying a secondary source. It's right there in the same volume. Yes. The guy who wrote the forward to that edition does a very nice job of kind of bringing it all together. I'm just saying that I'm kind of proud of us. I thought we did a pretty good job. Obviously, thanks to Tom for his vast expertise and insight into the book. And for endlessly taking us off track so we couldn't get through more than one paragraph <laughs> in an hour. <laughs> no, I think that it was really good. I really appreciate I think, you know, you guys have excellent, although you tried to make for the listeners that you don't need a lot of background, but the fact that you guys are reading tons of this stuff is what makes these conversations good. So I appreciate it as a listener. And I actually do jog while I'm listening to your podcast. Well, that's very healthy and nice of you.
<laughs> Thanks for saying that. Yes. Hey, sort of as my closing, I want to share comparable to Seth, my experience reading this. So when I got serious about this, I like I said last time, this was one of the first philosophy texts I was exposed to in undergrad, and it ended up being a major influence, like the major influence on my what became my undergrad honors thesis which then was later adapted and became, in a much modified way, my prospectus for my PhD that I was going to write that on. I mean, it was just all this analysis of consciousness stuff. But specifically in the undergrad thesis had to do with this shifting of identities and how that related to ethics. So when I hit graduate school and I had just uh, finished a seminar where we just went through Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, and I got like, wow, I could actually read whole big books like this. And they didn't have a Hegel's Phenomenology class so I did it as an independent study under Robert Solomon, which just meant I turned occasional things into him. Not that he would talk to me about it more than a couple times. As he said, he's like... He's the guy... I just noticed that he's the guy who has the blurb on the back of the Peach book. Yes, yes. Yeah, he's a, he's a major dude in this, but he'd already done yeah. this Hegel book, you know, in the 80s and really did not want to relive it with me and in, in fact right. said like, oh, it's very easy for these graduate independent studies to take as much time for as an instructor as an undergraduate course, like, which is just wrong. So he told me in advance, like, look, I'm not going to give you a lot of my time, but you're welcome to go through it and read my book and consult with me when you have questions and stuff like that. Mostly I just, I wrote a lot. So I would read a paragraph of this and then I would write like a half a page on what I thought it meant and sort of do what we're doing here a little bit, but even in more detail, having these dialogues with myself, trying to figure out alternate interpretations of this. And I think this is the text that requires active reading in this way. I mean, I think a good philosophy student does that with everything they read, but I have been very lazy in most of the way we've been reading things for all these podcast episodes. You know, when I read Heidegger, I took a few notes, but mostly I just read it while I was traveling and I didn't write, I don't want to read sitting at a computer typing shit now. Like that's irritating to me. So I didn't even do that with the Hegel this time. I did that for about the first two or three sections of the self-consciousness. So like a total of a couple pages. And that was it. And I know like to really even get the mastery that I had of this material before, I would have to do that with this entire thing because there's so many nuances yeah. of what's going on here. I feel like we've gotten a good understanding of overall what happens in these sections, but that doesn't mean that I will understand what is being said in any particular sentence. I think that, <laughs> I don't know if both to you guys and to the audience, let me say that I honestly would have to recommend by far more than any other secondary text, Alexander Kojev's Introduction to the Reading of Hegel, Lectures on the Phenomenology of Spirit. It is a absolute classic. It's very clear to read. It's really enjoyable to read. I would say most of my understanding of the book comes from that book. All right. And Tom will do a nice blog post on that. Then I'll try to do that with uh, Solomon as well. Cool. But yeah, I did get to the point this time in reading this where I got comfortable enough with the style again that I could get through it with some speed so that this whole unhappy consciousness part, I was able to read through without dying. <laughs> without, you know, I could get early on. I was like, ah, I really, there's two more pages left. Oh my God. How am I going to get through these two pages? <laughs> it would really be agonizing. But I finally went back and read enough of it and looked at some of the secondary literature where at least I could get through it, which is how I felt by the end of the Husserl reading, I guess is the same thing, where you're at least comfortable enough with the language that it doesn't stop you. You might not understand all of it, but at least you can get through it. And that provides a foundation so that when you go to secondary sources, you can have read the primary text and relate it back to something. And then when you come back to the primary text, you can read it with new insight. And so I think that's the way it's done. I just, I would need to be forced or, you know, have another month spent on this, which I don't want to spend right now to do it right. This text is not enjoyable. I have to say, it is so hard. It's so hard going. My appreciation of Hegel, it really does come more from a lot of these secondary sources. And I have to say that when I sit down and read the phenomenology itself, I don't really enjoy it. So that's kind of a weird thing, because it's hard to recommend something to people that you just really don't even <laughs> enjoy reading. <laughs> you know? Well put. Next time... We are going to read something much easier. John Locke's Second Treatise on Government from 1690. An essay concerning the true original extent and end of civil government. It just flies by compared to, <laughs> compared to this. <laughs> it is pure cake. So enjoy that. Everybody should go to partiallyexaminedlife.com. We will have blog posts that elaborate some of the points made on this in the previous episode. Links to other resources, videos. There's a really good discussion. We have a lot of smart people that are posting things going into a lot more detail on some of these issues than we can get into in the episodes themselves. You can also follow us on Twitter. 
You could uh, join our Facebook group. You could go on iTunes and give us a nice review, rating. I will predict that by the time this posts, we shall have reached 100 ratings since we have, I think, 97 right now. So I will be optimistic. So, yay. Thank you for all those folks who have done that in the past and uh, who have supported us in various ways. And thanks, Tom, for coming on. And thanks, Seth. And no thanks to Wes for feeling sick tonight. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Tom. And everybody, feel free to uh, go and visit suhenden.com also to see what Tom's got going on over there. But uh, as far as I'm concerned... Good night. Good night. I'd like to say something about you, but I have no way to really speak my mind, cause English is a language. I die desire, I sit require, I need, I care, I fall, I fare. Fairly well, it's just my mind's in hell. I die desire, I sit require, I need, I care, I fall, I fare. Fairly well, it's just my mind's in hell. Heart on my sleeve, leaving a stain. I don't know how I'll deal with the strain In the future gets warlike I hope there's a truce for now I'm defending what may be true Some chicken and I tore down each blood alley Follow it through with a mental train Getting back on the road that I've never been off of Licking the wounds that I've counted in my brain Does it sound insane? I buy desire I see require I need, I care, I fall, I fear Minds in hell, I die desire, I seek require, I need, I care, I fall, I fare. Fairly well, it's just my mind's in hell. I've long lost counsel, the mental I love you. Yes, I don't say them too much anymore. Maybe I'd like to just start it all up again. Maybe that's what I've been singing this for. Horse down each blind alley, follow through with a mental train. Get back to the road that I've never been off of, licking the wounds that I've gouged in my brain. Does it sound insane? I die desire, I soon require. I need, I care, I fall, I fare. Fairly well, it's just my mind's in hell. I die desire, I soon require. I need, I care, I fall, I fare. My mind's in hell, I die desire. I see you require, I need, I can't do up my hair. I hate those old my lair. I live, I die.